Hello, everybody. I see more people coming here on site, and I hope all of you are still watching us online. I have some news for you. We're going back to school. Just kidding. But there will be a lesson. A lesson from investing in 414 startups by Marvin Liao, who is an X500 startup investor. The talk will be hosted by Ahmad Pirai, the director of Startup uh, Grind Warsaw. So enjoy the talk. Summit. Uh, love the name. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I've, been, I've been in Silicon Valley now for about San Francisco specifically, for about 21 years. So my previous career did start us for a couple of years, uh, then was executive at Yahoo for about a decade. Um, angel investors, so I did about like eight angel deals during my two year sabbatical. And then I joined 500 startups um, back in 2014. So I started the San Francisco office for 500 startups. So I ran the core. Uh, accelerate program in San Francisco and was a partner um, over there uh, on the investment committee for Fund 3 and Fund 4. I uh, left 500 end of last year. And so this year, so did my sabbatical year. And just I started kind of like COVID kind of took a lot of my plans by surprise. And so I started, um, you know, this year I've been advising a bunch of family offices, um, starting to kick off some more personal sort of investing. And yeah, that's basically it. And actually just really goofing around. Nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, anybody else who would basically send me an email from Yahoo, I always have a problem. I was like, that's a spammer. But like, when you send me an email from Yahoo, and I was like, oh, that, that's Marvin. So I can basically yeah. filter my email list and who is sending it at Yahoo, you know, with you. Yeah, people laugh at me, but it's just like, I'm loyal. Yahoo is really good to me. <laughs> so. Do you also search on Yahoo or? No, no, it's a Google guy. <laughs> that's how you find Wolf Summit. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Going back to the region, um, first of all, uh, we right now try to take a look at the surge in uh, COVID situations comparing to Europe versus the U.S., taking a look at the presidential election back in the U.S., and the Brexit again back in the U.K. How do you really see the situation and the future of uh, whatever is happening in the Central Europe? Um, I, I'm actually quite bullish in general. I've always been, and I've been public about this. I've always been pretty, pretty bullish in general about the startup scene in, in Central Eastern Europe. And as you know, I've, I've actually been spending a lot of time out there. You know, like I used to run the region for 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 Yahoo, so I, I've been familiar with the region. And uh, when I first started investing, I, I actually have spent a lot of time in the region, partly because of the, the incredible technical talent. I also think it's sort of like a fairly widespread sort of use of English. So many companies have been. You know, I would say at least global mind from the beginning. And I've also, you know, as an investor, you know, if I take a look at some of my best performing companies are actually from the region. So uh, ManyChat is from Russia, CodeJS from Russia, um, you know, Growbot from Poland, um, you, know, you guys probably know. So like, you know, I have a lot of companies, you know, like very, very you know, high performing companies actually from the region overall. So I'm pretty bullish overall. Good. Um, but how do you see the trend? Do you think like the numbers are growing or like it's somehow like you have one offs? How, how does that work? I, I do think it's growing. Right. I, I think so. For example, I, I, I think one thing that I really opened up the eyes of a lot of investors and and this is something I've, I've believed in a long time of, you know, there, you know, there's this little unicorn out of, um, you know, out of Romania that, that was just like, wait a minute, there's like great companies and come out of this region, which is ridiculous. of course they, they can. Right. But I, I think sort of like it's it's like for most people, whether you're a startup founder or whether you are an investor. Like it is helpful of just like having real data of just like wow, like really, really impressive companies can come out of the region. That happened a couple of years ago. And so I, I definitely think that opened up a lot of investors' eyes. And that's a no-brainer for me, knowing sort of like considering sort of sort of like the wake-up call of just like how many incredible starts have come out of Hungary, right? How many incredible starts are starting to come out of Romania, you know, Poland as well, too. Like or, or for example, like uh, the Baltic region. So I'm an investor in Printify, which is just like crushing it right now. Yeah. Um, like there are some like good companies. Like like I'm an investor in Printify, so I'm a big, you know, personally a big fan. Um, like there's great companies coming out of the region. So you are not sitting in Central Europe. If somebody somehow tried to sit in the Central Europe and then try to be an attractive startup, what really makes a startup attractive for you? Um. 
you know, so so I think think for example, like I usually don't worry as much about the product. The products are almost always very good for me. Where it's like even if it's a pre seed stage or like a seed stage company, like some initial sort of like growth or data that shows that they're they're getting sort of like interest from like U.S. users, um, or I say, or at least or a very broader. Uh, view for like a broader customer base, right? So, for example, if Printify showed up and said, "Hey, like I'm making this amount of money, or I have this many users, but we're all from Latvia," like I'm not going to care, right? Uh, what was interesting was like, well, actually, a very large subset of your customer base is actually, or a very large user base of yours is actually from the U.S. That that's interesting. For example, like if a company right now wants to be invested, uh, you know, by one of the companies in the U.S., do you think they have to have Delaware Incorporation, or just being in the U.K. and being in Europe is going to be enough? Um, it depends on the investor. I, I, you know, obviously, it's much easier being, you know, having a Delaware Corporation. And so, my take for this is why I tell a lot of my founders is like, look. If your goal is to be in the U.S., you might should just like bite the bullet and just like set up your know, legal entity now. It's just one less reason to sort of say no, particularly if you're a U.S. investor. I, I, you know, having said that, I think a lot of U.S. investors are like, you know, there there have been a lot of U.S. over to to Europe and investing there, so it's less of an issue. Where like if it was like three years ago, it's like yeah, there's just no way. Now I, I do think there's a little bit more of an openness uh, for a VC or U.S. investor invest in Europe because just like the number of really interesting companies coming out. But, you know, like it is helpful, right? One less reason to say no. Of course. Getting a bit out of the whole startups, are there any part of ecosystem builders that somehow would help the VCs to approach startups better? You know, I don't know. I don't know if there's some something sort of like the local folks can do. I mean, Dave, if you have great companies, like investors will knock down the door. Like as you can, as you can probably tell right now, in the U.S., there is almost like a point of just like too much money chasing too few sort of startups. And yeah. some people argue that's not the case, but that's one of the reasons you're seeing starting to be like really, really good VC funds like Kleiner Perkins and other folks, um, you know, like Union Square Ventures, actually like venturing over to Europe, right? Lightspeed has done a bunch of deals out there. Like these are top tier VCs and investors and they're starting to realize like, wait a minute, valuations are kind of nuts here. And there's great companies coming over, you know, like there's just great companies everywhere. You're starting to see them travel a lot more. That's a good thing. That's actually a long term, a very, very good thing. Plus, with COVID, uh, the reality is just like doing a Zoom call. It's the same thing of just like talking to a founder here in San Francisco to a founder in Warsaw. So, so these are ultimately, I think, you know, good things that are leveling the playing field overall. I mean, uh, I'm trying to just say with a, you know, just put, having a grain of salt, but like, do you think that COVID was a good thing for the European startups in that sense? I think so. I, I mean, look, the, you know, like COVID in the long run, you know, is, is like, you know, it's, it is a, it is a tragedy, right? It's a, it's a international tragedy, but at the same time, it actually has sped up a lot of like digitalization for a lot of, you mm -hmm. know, for a lot of big companies who are becoming customers, right? Mm -hmm. There's specific areas of like you know ed tech or video games or other things other areas that weren't like it's just flipped the it, it's really really completely changed the competitive landscape and completely changed the consumer behavior and so that all long run is going to be a good thing for startups i mean uh, just talking about the startup grind so we ended up having a small problem in the beginning because we couldn't have in-person events at all and at the same time we have our global events but then uh, we started basically onboarding uh, our uh, events online because we have our platform called Bevy. And then all of a sudden we saw that we gather so much more data by just having people online. And then we had once a month event and then we saw that, you know what, we can even have multiple events per month. So all of a sudden that thing that somehow bring everything down, somehow totally had a change and then we managed to somehow change it. And at the same time, we started heavily investing on Bevy, that was our online platform. But a lot of startups really have this problem of understanding how to cope with the current reality. How do you really think as an investor, you can try to see what they can do to not only have a lower valuation, but rather try to even, you know, get some new um, features that would be even better investable? Well, I, I think it's 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 not easy to say, but it's just like it's sort of facing reality, right? And and really understanding: are you a COVID beneficiary or 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 a 
COVID casualty and the travel industry, right? Like that's, that's a tough space. I just flew back and I mean, it's weird walking through the airport and there's like hardly anybody around. And (laughs) I think it's acknowledging sort of like, you know, like how bad sort of like your market and your, your customer situation is. And, and, and some of them end up pivoting into it, right? Where it's like, how do we change either we go after new customer base or new sector, or how do we just try to find a way to sort of last for the next one or two or three years until things get back to some semblance of normality. But I think the biggest thing, like, like, and, you know, startups are like humans, right? Facing reality is actually really important and understanding, you know, just how bad it is. If it's really, really bad, like, the question is, do you continue or not, right? Like, do you want to take the pain for the next two or three years? And this is a conversation I've had with a lot of my old portfolio 500 over the last six months of just like, okay, like, what do you want to do now? Right? Like you're in this space. It's awful. Like, what should we do? Right? Like how do you survive, you know, if assuming that's what you want to do or throw in the towel, right? Like th- there's nothing wrong with that. Like if you're like, crap, like I don't want to do this for the next three years when things are going to be really, really awful. I think it's just facing reality and other folks have just ended up pivoting and, and actually doing better. So I've had a bunch of companies that were just like, okay, like let's go find a way to sort of cut a cost. You know, do we go find new customer base? A lot of them did. How do we retool or how do we just like really go the team really, really hard to fix a bunch of stuff that we need to fix anyways. Um, one of the challenges I always see is the lack of omni-channel. Where do you really think that uh, we're going to have something at least a bit close to that? That if you as an investor would really want to check something, because, you know, Crunchbase tried to do that, Angel tried to do that, but still VCs have to come over and uh, let's just say also waste a lot of time. Do you really see any platform that somehow tries to help it, either via, via an event or via some like online platforms? Yeah, not really. You know, nothing that has really shown up. I've seen a lot of sort of investor startup matching, you know, sort of like platforms and things. I just haven't really seen them take off yet. And, and a lot of folks have tried this. Um, so, so you know, I, I do think like, look, we're only, it, it seems like longer. We're probably seven months into the crisis, right? If you think about that. And so I, I still think there's a lot of, shifting still that's actually happening and and you know both for the investor and for startup founders there's still a lot of uh, we're still trying to understand how to operate in this world yeah i i organize a lot of different events and uh i was organizing random events and uh i just saw that a lot of people are dating and i was like you know what let's just organize the speed dating i organized the speed dating and i was like all the girls are out and all the guys are in and i was like that is not a speed dating uh, so this is a metaphor that I usually have is like, it's like startup world is like Tinder, but full of guys, you know, it's just like when you don't really have something that uh, is somehow spice things up, then you basically see that all of these people, because supply and demand don't properly match. Yeah. We have lots of different platforms. And again, as an investor, I really feel rather than just focusing specifically on startup, I'm mainly my addressing my questions because of your five, 414 different like, ideas. Where do you really see we can try to focus in order to make sure that this uh, is going to be a systematic approach that we don't, we can basically circulate it and then try to always bring back the best startups? Hmm. Oh, that's, 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 that's a great question. I, I mean, like I said, you know, investing or fundraising is still a people business. And so, you know, I, I'm just a little bit skeptical about these platforms. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why, where, where I'm, I'm still like, I, somebody, you know, some random actually emailed me. So, you know, the cold email stuff and I, I, <laughs> good mood so like i wrote back and like look you know i usually will not invest in sort of like you know like likelihood like i'm happy to give you feedback but investing is very very low because they're just so the weird signal um because i you know whether you think it's fair or not you know i still value sort of like introduction i know a lot of people right i've been i have a lot of vc friends or angel friends and so for my beautiful i don't need to go like you know, hunt myself right actively go out and look for companies and things too but you know what i tell folks is just like there is a signal of just like when let's say you you make an intro to me a mod of a startup like i'm more likely to go and you know to pay more attention because it, some like me who's been in the industry for a long time the network is actually really important that's a filter and so whether you think that's fair or not that's still that's still just a reality and i still think a lot of investors still act you know still have to have some filters like this in place filters are very important to sort of like help you sort of like 
figure out the signal versus a noise, right? Because there's a lot of noise. If, okay. if, I spent, if I took my time to answer every single ping on Facebook or like email, cold emails or LinkedIn or Twitter, like I wouldn't be able to like, just, there's just, I wouldn't be able to do anything else, right? So we need these filters. And I still think these filters, even in a digital world, like, you know, in a COVID world, they're still, I would argue they're probably even more important. Do you really think some uh, foundations like Peter Thiel Fellowship are doing a good job by being in Western cultures and leaving the Central Europe out? Yeah, I, I think they're making a mistake by leaving leaving sort of like Central Eastern Euro Europe out, right? Like there there is, I I I am ultra ultra bullish on the region, um, and and to the point where like you know I'm spending I'm going to be spending time there as soon as I can travel again, right? And and so you know like that this this for me like I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm yeah. just like you're gonna see deals being done by me, like they'll be from the region. So let's just say that the startup grind and you, we're just gonna see if we can try to take the Peter Thiel and then try to bring his money, as you say, you know, where the real talent is. Because one of the things that you mentioned is that the maturity sometimes have an exact value, you know, direct thing with the number of the money, the amount of the money that's being invested in. So we see a lot of talents and not proportionate uh, with the amount of the, you know, the, the investment. There's a, imbalance. There's a huge yeah. imbalance of the, of the talent. Of, of really the quality entrepreneurs, you're starting to see second time entrepreneurs coming about, and and these are like, you know, like for them, they're thinking, and and that has not been the case. Like that's really only come up in the last few years, I would argue. I mean, you invested in one of them, robots. I mean, Greg was always for me is a you know poster boy for for a Polish guy that you know like right now he's an international superhero for himself. Yeah, he's he, you know, like he's built a very interesting business, right? Like they've had some challenges, but uh, you know it's coming around, and so like the they're they're doing well. Yeah, very good. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much time we have right now on uh, our you know our two clock, but uh, just to somehow summarize, summarize the whole idea. So first of all, uh, we basically discussed about the whole idea that startups have to have some statistics, and then let's just say, as people call it, you have to show some meat in order to basically try to attract the VC. You also mentioned that we just don't have to have our own filtration in order to make sure that we don't waste a lot of time for the VC. And and by the other, waste your own time, right? And also waste totally. your own time. You waste your own time. Who cares about the VC? Not wasting your time. Totally. And on the other hand, also, hopefully we will build a better bridge that somehow will uh, somehow collide the Western world and the Eastern and then try to somehow try to get the best out of both uh, parts. And hopefully in the end, we're just going to bring some big fishes into the small part of the Europe and then try to see, you know, like what the result of that would be. Was that it's good? Gonna, yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I keep I keep my fingers crossed for, for that one. Is there any last word that you wanted to say just to, you know, have some messages for, you know, like people in this part of the town? Yeah, I, I mean, what, what I definitely say is just like, you know, you should be very bullish and you should be optimistic. Um, I mean, the rest of the year is going to be a, a crap show, right? Like overall, <laughs> I, I just think if you can hold on, it's going to be challenging this year. This year, I would argue, not just in the U.S., but I think globally, this year, next year. But I think if you can hold on and continue focusing on your customer and building something interesting, I, I think it's going to be like it's it, we're going to go through crazy boom times after. Awesome. So just hang on. Did you vote? Not yet. I'm. I, that's why I came back. So yes, I'm going to be voting soon. Good. So I'm not going to take your time more than that. Just make sure that you vote. And at the same time, you know, like all the best for the whole ecosystem. And uh, looking forward to seeing you in person very soon. For sure. Thank I'll you very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.